everyone. Joseph, thank you thank for that. You. That last one just whew, pierced me. Um, and of course, I had you know, my first question all organized. And after hearing that, I don't think I can ask it <laughs> right now. Because I want to know where that song came from. Um, were you, did you have a kind of odyssey in a cab? There's an amazing um, film clip for this. And you really are kind of taken around New York City. So where did this special song come from? Mm. Um, well, I start, I, you know, I just, I don't know. It was like I, I wanted to focus on some kind of depart, sense of departure. And so I was thinking about, about a death-like figure. Um, or I was thinking about like Karen who takes people over the river Styx, you know. Um, but then, you know, what if he, I mean, it's not an original, um, you know, an original alteration to have him driving a car, but it's something that's in the, you know, popular imagination. And so I was thinking about that scenario. And um, I guess I wrote the song in a, as with a couple other songs in the similar vein, mm -hmm. just in a kind of like trance-like state. So I don't remember it. Okay, but so trance-like states. Yeah. Is it true that you've had hallucinations since you were a child? Um, yes. Just I to go have. right in there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When I was a child, I, I hallucinated a glowing frog. And you're not going to elaborate on that? I mean, that? It, maybe it wasn't a hallucination. I don't know. You know, <laughs> There was some, like, toxic waste around. Okay. Um, well, okay, so the shroom... But I am often in a hypnagogic state. I mean, it's happened a little less recently, but often in my childhood, up until now, I, yeah, I see a lot of creatures at night, um, you know, and they move and everything, and I don't know why, but I always see these creatures. That is why a person like me shouldn't do shrooms. So, so you see these without because any... Yes. Input, you know. Without input. Right. I would rather have the opposite of shrooms at, at times. So when, I mean, this shroom trip seemed to have a huge, huge impact on you, enough that you subsequently had to write this beautiful opera about it. But when it happened in, for real, in, you know, and you'd come to afterwards, what were your big realizations? I mean, I think I was just trying to pick up the pieces uh, more than having a realization. I mean, you know, I don't really necessarily trust realizations that you come to through, through drugs. I mean, there are too many people prattling on about how they're so creative when they smoke a joint. And, you know, I, I always found it put me in a sort of sometimes, you know, nice stupor, you know. I mean, <laughs> if you live in a small town in West Michigan, maybe it's nice to take a break sometimes. <laughs> but it was not a creative, exactly, experience to be on pot. Um, the shroom trip, I mean, I took all these shrooms because I am basically a sensualist who likes to eat chocolate, and so I ate all the chocolate, even though they were mad at me because I ate, like, everybody's shrooms. Um, and what was the question? Oh, the realization. <laughs> so, in other words, so... So then it completely, I mean, I didn't stop tripping. I mean, I may be tripping still. <laughs> I did not stop tripping. I, I went to this music publishing company and I had to count violin parts. Each violin part I counted, I would have a different memory from some time in my life. And so it, it just kind of, I ha it exploded my sense of time, of chronology, um, well, and it, of it, self. Yeah, yeah, listening to that, it sounds like that is your... But, process of yeah. gathering things that have happened to you, memories. But people, most, I mean, a lot of times people, it depends, I mean, if I do it, it's like, if I do it in a comedy context, people just think the whole thing is fun. I mean, it's fine if it's funny. For me, it's not. But that's just, that's something that's, I mean, you know, what, that I was going to cut out my voice box was frightening. Of course, it's a conflict that is always already resolved as I am singing about this incident. So, 
You know, if you think about it, you can't be too worried. Did he cut it out? No, he didn't. So, <laughs> you know. Okay, yeah. okay. So going back to your childhood, yeah. firstly, when did your voice break? When did you discover this voice of yours? And you were also a goth for a period. We saw one of the pictures, but he's also done this another goth piece. Aria, yeah. mm -hmm. We were going to do that, but then the PowerPoint couldn't do it. But also, I was going to run real way over anyway. So that's, yeah, that's a part of your history. Yeah. And so how do you reconcile being an opera kid with being a goth? Well, I think that's very easy. I mean, okay. Dido's Lament is, I mean, opera is quite, is rather okay. gothic. You know, it's a kind of, I mean, it's a morbid form in a way, and it's, an anti, it's possibly an antiquated form, and I think the whole goth thing is about the past. I mean, it's kind of a, a kitschy, um, appropriation of the past in a way, but I, I was I was sort of a mixture of a of a lot of different countercultures. You know, I mean, sometimes in one like I would have like a tie dye shirt and some bondage pants. I mean, I liked to mix them, <laughs> um, but you know, I was the sort of goth who was you know reading Lautremont and Baudelaire and you know listening to Dido's Lament and you know, but I, and I was the also the only goth. I should point this out. I was the only goth, so I had to imagine what that meant. Oh, okay. And when I met other goths, I was like, oh, not a goth. <laughs> they were all like, they were all just like computer nerds <laughs> who were on these like message boards and things. I met them in Detroit and then I, you know. And you didn't like them, you liked No, I mean, version. if I, you know, when I, if I, when I was a subculture unto myself, I was happy. Okay, so back to when did you discover this voice? And did you wear like your bondage pants and your, you know, tie-dye t-shirt to class? Or when did that Yes, start? I wore telephone cords, African robes, um, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of women's clothing from TJ Maxx. Um, and some, you know, goth accoutrement as well. And pewter satanic jewelry as a, you know. <laughs> But, you know, with the telephone cord, you have to have both things going on. Um, and so I guess as a teenager, I was interested in mostly singing like these blues songs. I, um, I also wanted to be, you know, uh, a blues singer. So I sang like Gloomy Sunday and St. James Infirmary and all these bluesy dirges, you know, and um, played the piano. Um, and accompany myself, and then I started taking voice lessons because I, I didn't know, really know how to sing, or you know, and I was always real aggressive, but I couldn't, I couldn't sustain. I would like sound like Tom Waits after one song, which is good. I mean, but you know, <laughs> I wanted to have another option too, so I started. Was taking there these someone voice who lessons. discovered? Like, do you go to a class and they say, "Let's start here," you know, I, and then you do the range up and. Was there that voice teacher who was like, holy shit, like, you have this well, range? I think I had a voice teacher, um, I think it was a gra kind of gradual process for mm -hmm. somebody to say that I had um, a big range, you know. Yeah, and then people, t you know, then the, uh, it's like gets a little technical for, you know, some people, oh, no, you're a Verdi baritone. No, he's a bass baritone. No, basso profunda. No, you know, it's like, so there are all these different... Um, there's the, this nomenclature and, and these different, the different ways that the voice is constructed in the classical world, which is, is kind of different than in the popular world. So um, I was, uh, you know, at some point designated to be a rangy bass, but then I kind of shapeshift with my voice in, in other ways and can sound like different singers. So that's part of the range too, is like, to, you well, know, to adopt different timbres and different... Yeah, um, I mean, that kind of goes to this idea that you are... We, when we think of opera, we think of it's kind of a grand epic taking on wars and um, battles and, you know, revenge. But you take kind of the mundane aspects of your life or some of the mundane aspects and make it operatic and grand. 
When did you feel that it was okay to take those little small moments and make them so grandiose? Well, I mean, to me, and this is something that somebody pushed me to acknowledge, the scholar named Vicky Petraco. We spent 12 hours in a tiny hotel room in Midtown, and she eventually pushed me to realize that I, didn't, I don't experience these things as mundane. I, well, I guess <laughs> none me, of us do. They actually out. seem large. Um, so, I'm sorry. No, no, it's no. It wasn't. It was not like. Of course, they seem mundane. But I'm just saying. You know, I'm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To me, oh, you know, they seem large. So the fact that I um, went on some somnambulant journey out of the office to buy bondage pants one afternoon to <laughs> reclaim my teenage goth self, to me that seemed like a great odyssey, you know, and like. And, and, you know, like some reclamation of an earlier self. And, so, and you know, I, in that piece, too, it's, I was trying, I was saying, going back to my teenage self, saying I felt nostalgic for somebody else's youth. So then there are these certain episodes where I feel a, a sense of weight psychologically, and usually they kind of extend out. So in that one, I think it's about the culture, the American culture of nostalgia. And, and the way in which we, we want to be rebellious, we want to, have an auth we want to be authentic, but we do that by kind of imitating some past version of rebellion and some past version of authenticity. So that's actually a condition that is not, not nothing. You know, that's an interesting cultural condition. So the goth thing is, of course, a whimsical song that where I kind of do this Schubert, like romantic um, piece of lead, going to get the bondage pants. But somehow it extends out into something, it touches on something broader. So, and t so I think that's the trick for me is, <clears throat> if an episode has this weight, then I figure out what the, how it's, how it's somehow, you know, I'm not trying to say it's a great, you know, profound masterpiece, but <laughs> It does have this other element. Well, they so. touch us. I mean, the music touches us so deeply. So I think it but starts I, to take on. Well, we think of all the. I think of the moments in my <laughs> life. I'm like, oh, I did, you know, do not. I didn't buy bondage pants, but maybe some other strange mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, well, I, and I guess it's also there's something interesting about creating though about focusing on a small moment and you, and then drawing out something that's inside of it through dramatic music mm -hmm. you know so and <clears throat> i had started you know i had had these i had been singing and i had been doing these monologues and writing things and at a certain point i decided that they should merge and it felt really gimmicky to me and like something that i shouldn't do but it was in a way the most obvious thing that I should do, translate and my fun, autobiographical, yeah, and fun, yeah, and fun. So, yeah, I think there's something interesting too about about the juxtaposition. I know that's on like the list of like that's on like the Art Speak Word Watch and has been for some time. <laughs> juxtaposition, I you know, but I couldn't think of a better one in this very moment. So, is there anything that's off limits from your life that you won't put into your work? I mean, you. Um, the the piece that you've done with your mom, the cat lady, it's very poignant, and it, I mean I don't know if it's completely biographical or not, but you also have another piece that you, where you talk about having sex on a pile of people. In a pile. Oh oh, in a pile. How does that work even? <laughs> How many well, of you? I believe that there is a meet and greet after this, and so we can all we can try it. Experience it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I did have sex in, the mo in a certain movie um, with people. I mean, yeah, you know, I did. I, and then I, I made that little, this little French song about it. Um, but, you know, to me, putting it in French made it seem kind of dis more distant, you know? It, I'm revealing, but I'm mediating, you know? So I like to, I only like to confess in other languages. Oh, that's a great... I'm going to take that on. Okay, so which is your favorite language to confess in? And what... I mean, it's, you, you sing in Italian, German. What other languages? French. In French. Oh, yeah. Thanks. But um, 
I don't know. I think they're each suited to something different. I mean, I tried to not use them in totally stereotypical ways, but I tried to use them in a way that had... A juxtaposition. Yeah, but also in... <laughs> the, so the, the shroom thing, well, that's a... I don't know if that's like a... It's some kind of Italian aria. I mean, the, the French thing, it's more like sex, whatever. I had sex in a pile of people. And then the, the other thing I <laughs> rendered in French was this sort of thing where I'm kind of don't feel like working and I'm very defiant. And then the German thing is, is um, it's like a Schubert thing. So it's about a wand, you know, this tradition, romantic tradition of wandering, mm -hmm. the wanderer and going on some sort of journey. So that I went on the journey to buy the pants. So I just try to think about something that kind of uh, works with the content that resonates in the hi that hi the history of that um, language and its art, art. Yeah. Switching tacks a little bit. I know we really want to know just exactly how the pile of people worked. Well, but I mean, I mean, I didn't really have sex with all the people. You know, I had sex with actually only one um, person, but there were a bunch of. Did other you know people the around. one you wanted to have sex with when you got in the pile? No, I feel I like knew, that's what I, I would do. I knew. I'd be like, I just want to like. Oh, I get knew close the person very well. We were, you know, it was this woman named Erin Markey. I mean, and we, you know, we had sex in this pile of people. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what happened. But, um, you know, I didn't have sex with the other people. I, you know, orgies, I like them if I'm in charge of them. <laughs> if there are other people who wouldn't necessarily be, you know, it wouldn't be the first thing on their mind to have an orgy, and I could sort of engineer it, that's good. If there's already an orgy happening, I'm happy, it's fine, but I do not want to participate. I will, be, I will stay there, but I would rather read <laughs> among them. Yeah. Okay. So that's okay. my, and I, I guess if there's anything off, there are lots of things off limits, but I don't know. I, I mean, I like th saying things that I have done and things that have happened, but I don't really like to kind of be confined, say anything that will confine me in a certain um, identity or something. Yeah. I'm just resistant to that for some reason. But I think you should be as an artist. You don't want to close yourself off to an I future idea or thought. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, then. Good. Um, <laughs> okay, so I've heard that you may have auditioned for The Voice or you were, you were kind of tricked into auditioning. What do you think of all these reality TV shows? Well, I think their moment has kind of, they seemed more threatening. They seemed like sort of really horrible a few years ago. I think they kind of lost their centrality, so they don't seem... Would um, you be a judge on one? I'd love to see that. If they asked I you. do like judging. <laughs> you mean just people in general? Like the or? only time I could be on time someplace is if... I'm supposed to judge something. Then I'll be early. So, you know, probably I would. But, um, you know, I would probably give them some, you know, more cryptic advice. You know, I'd probably try to go off script a bit. I mean, I don't really like the whole culture of singing competitions. I don't think... It's part of the whole thing where it's, it's basically just a grand spectacle of cultural karaoke. So do I think that's like a good for a, a society? Probably not. <laughs> so I, I found it, and I found it a very alien, I mean, I didn't mean to audition for The Voice. My friend and an employer um, registered the both of us to go, and then we went on this odyssey to New Jersey at this stadium, and it was very like a you know, Roman stadium. Uh, but they were doing paperwork in the middle of it. <laughs> and so, and then they like kind of separated us and disoriented. It was like 105 degrees. And I didn't want, of course I didn't want to, but I wanted to go and observe. So I was like a spy. And this is the other thing. Another good trick is you can do um, anything under the auspices of art. <laughs> so if there's a, you know, maybe there's a part of you that does want to audition for The Voice, but you can say that there was not and that you did it 
as an artistic investigation. <laughs> but I was disqualified because I sang an Elvis song and they, and they told us when we got there that you couldn't sing anything old. And then they kind of went through what that meant, you know, old. Oh, yeah. But it was interesting and I'm writing this really long piece about it. I mean, I wrote it, actually, I have to cut it down. Yeah. Did I answer the question? Yes, oh. yes. We just, there are no okay. correct answers here. Um, okay, so I also did some research and found out that you lived above an evangelical church at some point and that you could hear the singing and the minister literally coming through the floor at you. Mm -hmm. Has that worked its way into any performance yet? Mm. <laughs> it, it Do you believe it. in God? <laughs> it no, just came out. I, I don't believe in God, but I have a kind of uncategorized spiritual impulse. Mm -hmm. You know, Pasolini said he was an unbeliever who had the nostalgia for a belief. Mm, I, I think that, that I, I too, I'm going to get on that wagon. Well, I also, I mean, we haven't gone back to the evangelical but the, but the, question. But yeah, I mean, it was like his pulpit was underneath my bed, and he liked to, it's like this, and he liked to rehearse five times a day with these really loud karaoke tracks, and he would sing off-key at five in the morning, and they had all these weird services where the whole congregation would be under a blanket, and, um, and... He, How's the congregation under a blanket? They had a giant blanket. I'm like, is there more piles of sex? It feels like it, that's They comedy. might have been. I don't know. I wasn't under that blanket. Um, but, yeah, so it was, and I live also under a train, so I'm used to noise, but having an evangelical preacher with a pulpit under your bed with a sound system from hell is worse than the JMZ rattling by, I discovered. But it hasn't really made it into a piece yet. I want to do a piece about it, about all the noise around my apartment, all the people who show up outside the door in the middle of the night with a little radio banging their cowbells next to it, and the train, and the preacher, and there are a few other things. Okay. One time I had this friend who was like this witchy friend who decided he was going to go down and he was all like drunk and, you know, on some kick and he, on some trip. And he went down. He was like, I'm going to go down there and stare that preacher man in the eye. His eyes were all bloodshot. <laughs> and he was like, he was sort of like avenging me. You know, he was like, I'm going to do this for you to protect you. Because it was the middle of the night. This preacher was down there ah, ah, singing his karaoke tracks. And so my friend went down there and then proceeded to just text me the whole thing. So I was trying to sleep, and then he, I just kept getting the text from him. He sees me. He's afraid of me, you know. Now they're under a blanket. You know, it was like, so th it didn't help at all. It just, it just kept me awake. Going back to the God thing, and we don't, not in the way that, I don't know what I'm going to ask quite yet, but... I feel that when you sing, you are, it's like you're touched by something. Oh, I didn't mean, <laughs> that sounds so strange, and I don't mean it to sound cliche. I mean, I mean, we all heard it. It's like there's a, something happens to you, and it's a gift, and it's special. Are you, is that, are you channeling anything? Wow. It's eloquence on my behalf, but I think you know um, what I'm saying. Maybe, I think that, um, well, I was born on Day of the Dead, and people who are born on that, and sometimes I can tell if other people were born then, like I can just see them and know, like that actress Toni Collette, who did that show where she played all the different, she played the woman with the multiple personalities, and I just saw her and I was like, oh, yep, she was born. She was born on like November 1st or something. And a lot of people who are born at that time seem to kind of shape shift into different, um, yeah, take on different forms and be sort of spooky. Oh, and, excellent. you know, I'm no exception. I'm <laughs> November 6th, Scorpio. Scorpio, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you might be past the I, Yeah, I mean, zone. I wasn't born on the Day of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not particularly, I mean, as a ch I mean, as a child, I did kind of, I was a very witchy child, but 
I don't really, you know, I don't, I kind of have this thing, like that sort of vibe, but I don't, um, you know, it's not like I, ha I know anything about that, or I don't, I don't really have any formal beliefs or anything. But I like singing because you can kind of, a voice is outside the body and it can become different things. And it's almost like another presence. So that feels to me like, yeah, it, fe it feels like that, but who's to say? Well, it's often interesting to, to understand what the artist is feeling when they create their work and then what the audience is feeling. I mean, they can be, they're such, they can be completely different things. Like you can be having a shit day and, oh, you know, and thinking, God, this, this, you know, I don't know. It's just, we can cut that out. Um, <laughs> No. I'm interested, you collaborate with a filmmaker a lot to do your videos, which we haven't seen, but I'm wondering if there have been any collaborations that have been particularly profound in your artistic kind of growth. Yeah, I've worked a lot. I mean, Laura Teruzzo I've worked with a lot, and she's the filmmaker, and then I've worked with other video artists, um, and I have a whole host of people I, I work mm -hmm. with. Some people are here. I work with a violinist, Dan Bartfield, a lot. and Elizabeth Gimbel directed some things of mine. And I have, a, yeah, I have a lot of um, meaningful collaborations. So, okay. yeah, those are people. Maybe I think people I might have gone over a lot. Oh. So do we have questions from the audience right now? We can keep chatting, but I'm sure there has to be. Yes. I'm kind of curious if we have how we can take this step. Part of us that a lot of all these things that happen is called the imagination. Hmm. So how do you define, you know, imagination? Well, that's the biggest part of our natural intelligence, but where does it come from? How do you think it relates to our awareness of you know like it's not something that just depresses you? Depresses you? I think we just, oh, I just want to repeat your question. Do you want to repeat it, Joseph, because you've heard it? How do you define what imagination is? Okay. How do you define what imagination is? Um, I don't think I'm the person to ask. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> for all I know, the, you know, I've imagined this. I, you know, I imagined you, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a very blurry zone in my consciousness. Blurry. I live in the blur. Is there anything you do to, do you have to get into a creative headspace to write, or is it just happening to you everywhere you go in every waking moment? Um... I, I don't know. I think, well, of course, you have to kind of get into a, into a certain headspace if you have to write something. But, you know, I also like the idea, um, one of my mentors, Holly Hughes, when something she wrote said, I'm writing right now. I don't feel like I'm doing something. I feel like I'm not stopping something from happening. Mm -hmm. And I, th I like that attitude. And I think, I think, but you, of course, you have to there's a lot of effort. That's, I think it's probably like, like the Alexander technique, like when you go and they tell you that you're doing about five motions too many to sit down into a chair and you have to train yourself out of doing all these unnecessary physical things. I think with writing or creating something, you have to you know, stop doing all these. You get out of your own way in some way. I, oh yeah, please. I better repeat that. Who are your mentors and inspiration growing up, or who are some of them? You mean like f famous people, or? Well, anybody. Um, I mean, like, who, who, I mean, obviously, people in your real life inspire you to write. So, so, so you yeah. But like, who, when you were studying voice in particular, like, who did Well, you? you know, my mom is kind of, she sings, and so she's a singer. My parents are both artistic people, so. So you know, I was lucky in that, and that I was in that sort of environment, um, and that they were encouraging in that way. And I had a great voice teacher named Faye, 
when I was a teenager who, who was dramatic. And I've written about, too, a lot of people who are mentors are also muses, in my case. I don't know why. Um, yeah. And, yeah. That's, yeah. I forgot to say that you write a lot about art for Vice. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. And I'm interested, like, what happens when you're not the center of attention? <laughs> oh, I should just leave it there. <laughs> it's like, that's the question. Well, but in a lot of my stuff, too, you know, sometimes I, it is about somebody else, but it's kind of through me. Exactly. Um, and so I, I do have a really strong impulse to document other people. And so I think that I like writing about. Also, you know, I started as a visual artist, and I have a lot of, I'm interested in that world and that language and um, everything. So, but I don't really create visual art per se at this point. So it's that question was kind of a joke in the way it's, that it came out. I didn't mean that you are oh, at all okay. self-involved, but I meant oh, it must be interesting to kind of be on the other end and try and understand their artistic process. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I'm best at writing about somebody if I feel that they haven't been quite understood mm. and I feel like I could mediate or I have some sort of take on them. Um, I might be wrong. I might not have. But I, if, I, if I feel that, like, oh, I can really, you know, talk about what's going on here. Enlighten the... Yeah, yeah so then the I some story. sort of... Yes, it's, it's probably some sort of heroic... Um, complex or something. No, but I like, I like um, featuring other people and, and talking about other people and it's interesting. It doesn't feel like something that different for me mm -hmm. to, to do somehow. Yeah. Lassie. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, you talked about growing up in Western Michigan. Yeah. <clears throat> I was always unique, but <laughs> I, I mean, I was always like strange and people always thought I was like some, uh, people would think I was a foreign exchange student and all sort of things. I mean, I was like, <laughs> it was like, they sort of, you know, insisted on this. Um, but I was not, con I mean, I'm not sure that I'm, I, you know, you can kind of, I decided one day in the shower um, as a tween that I would act confident. I remember particularly, I was in, you know, another thing, good thing is to take showers um, and think in the shower uh, for me. So uh, yeah, I decided, I remember thinking, well, you can act confident and then maybe, you know, that trains your subconscious and then eventually you become confident because you think you are. Another question. Just oh, just repeat it. When oh, you went okay. when sure. you went to college, did sure. you find your tribe? Well, I've always had people, <clears throat> interesting people in my life, and I think when I was in growing up in Western Michigan, there were. Um, I've always, I've always had a kind of intergenerational friend group around me, and so when I was a teenager, I was friends with people who were, you know, in their 50s, and people who were in their 20s, and, um, but kind of odd, you know, kind of eccentric people. So I always, I always found other people who were outside, and maybe they were outside for different reasons, but they were all outside, and so... I found those people when I was in West Michigan, and when I was in college, I, I did, um, I, you know, I found other, other people who, are, who I remain friends with. But I, I have <clears throat> long-lasting relationships, um, I think, from all, all different parts of my life. So, does that answer your question? Or? I mean, in college, you know, I liked college. I mean, um, you know, I liked, I liked people, you know, but still I was friends with sort of the, some certain oddballs. I have a there. question. Yeah. What are your guilty pleasure, um, you know, albums or songs you listen to, and are there ones that you're embarrassed to talk about? 
Like huh? that new Bieber song. Who? Bieber? You know, that one that's just like, who, who, are are you who do you think, what is it? Are you a believe a believer? No, I'm not. But some songs just stick and you go. I don't, I didn't hear that song. I mean, you know, there's also a complex way, like when I was talking about, what was it? Oh, I don't remember anymore, but there's a complex way. Sometimes you can like something and hate it at the same time. Like I remember driving down the highway in Michigan and listening to like that song like, um, she's so high, high, high. <laughs> and I would cry and I hated it so much. <laughs> it was just this, this most disgusting, you know, expression. Um, but also somehow gripping, you know, so I would be crying, you know, and it was a complicated experience. <laughs> and, you know, so I don't feel ashamed if I like something. I just, you know, I feel more than one thing at once. Uh, I do notice recently that I can only clean or pack if I listen to the ultimate Robin playlist on YouTube. <laughs> it's not that I, it's, you know, I, I don't know if I like it. But I have to, I mean, but I will not, I wouldn't have been able to come here if I hadn't put it on <laughs> and put stuff in my suitcase. You needed that. I mean, yeah. is it, on the flip side, is there anyone that you love and I'm uh, just so impressed by and that it's made you want to be an artist? In the all of time? Yes. <laughs> From anywhere, anything. Yeah, lots of people. I mean, well, pick one for you know, me, please. Like, you know, like I mean, you know, Aretha Franklin, Screamin' Jay Hawkins, and David Bowie, and um, you know, uh, Alice Neal. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I can't remember. But lots of people. Uh, yeah, lots That's of good. Okay. Fra Angelico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guys, any more questions? I think we're good. Oh, yes, good. we have one more. Repeat it. I have to. <clears throat> is there, oh my gosh, now I'm going to butcher it. I it was such a great question. I was like, how the hell did I, I can not repeat have that it. in my official ones? You go. I kind of remember yeah. it. So she asked me if, because I work in several mediums, if there is one that feels truer to me, or if I go through different um, phases where I do one thing more than another. And I would say I do go through different phases, but I'm not sure it's a natural progression and I think that part of what I like and the logic that I create is kind of moving in between these things. So I don't necessarily see them as as so wildly different, but I do like moving between. So I like that <clears throat> that sense of movement. Um, it and it's just but then I get interpreted in a lot of different ways. So I think it's more of a it's not really um, I think it's more of a marketing problem than a creative one. Yeah. I'm interested at, from that. Do you feel you have to market yourself in a certain way? Is that I feel like for artists, that's a really we were just talking about it earlier. Really, um, if it doesn't come naturally to you, it's a pretty crippling process to have to self-promote in a way that feels like you might have to now. Yeah, I don't mind self-promoting some, but it's, um, I think it is, once, I think people, you know, most people who are interesting, there's really nobody like them. So, once you, they're known enough, you just accept them as some kind of fact of nature. You know, they can be allowed, they can be permitted to do more than one thing, they can do, but if you're not at a certain level, you're kind of, yeah, you're kind of like a shifty character if you're, if you're doing a few things. So I'm not really wor that worried about it I anymore. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just because, why worry? Exactly. Well, thank <laughs> you so much. It was a beautiful. Thank you so much, Anthony.